right, if you want to open your Bibles this morning to um, Psalm chapter 95. Psalm chapter... All right, I already moved that. I knew there were several things I had to do when I got up here, so... Psalm chapter 95 is where we're going to start this morning. Uh, one thing that, uh, while you turn there, one thing that um, was left off the announcements, uh, guys do a good job getting all that up there, but still sometimes we miss some things. But uh, Penny Roberts is going to have a cataract surgery tomorrow. So um, let's remember her um, as she goes in to do that on her right eye, and let's pray that everything goes well with her. So I just want to make sure that, uh, that we still included that. Um, it's good to be back with you. It's been a while since um, I've had the opportunity to stand up here and um, share God's word with you, but it's good to be back. Again, always thankful for those who can fill in and uh, those who do such a great job in, in helping do God's work here. I, I appreciate it so much, and I'm sure you do as well. Uh, I announced this a while back that we were going to do this, and we'll go ahead and start this today. But we're going, through, going, to, going to go through a series of lessons on the home. Um, I have a lot of young parents here, a lot of young parents. There's been a lot of babies that uh, have been born, uh, first children that have been born to a family in the last year. Um, a lot of you, kind of like Julie and I, you've got you know, several kids or they're on up in age a little bit. And you have some, obviously, that are older and anywhere in between. So these lessons are really important. It's important to us as parents. Uh, it's important to us as husbands, as wives. It's important to us as grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents that we even talked about today. We all play a role in the home, and we all need to really seriously consider that. These lessons are important because what you see happening in our society today is that the home is eroding. And when I say the home, really that's used in conjunction with understanding that we're talking about the family. The family is, in many ways, non-existent compared to the way that it used to be. And that's a problem. The devil knows what to attack if he wants to tear the church apart. And at the heart of every church is the home. And if our homes are not centered on God, if our homes are not centered on Christ, and if everybody is not striving to do their part to make sure that God's will is sought and done, then we're going to have problems. When you have stronger homes, you have stronger churches. And that's our goal, and that's what we want to be. So the title in the series of this lessons will be focused on the idea, God give us Christian homes. We're going to look at that song in our songbooks this morning as we go through this lesson. But I encourage all of us, regardless of where you're at, as far as within the family, whether you're just starting yours out, middle ways, towards the end, wherever, we all play a part in the home. But I would encourage you to consider very closely these lessons. These lessons are for me and for Julie. I'm preaching to what I know we need. But I think in doing so, we'll probably hit on a, a lot of things that we all need. Uh, because we all need to make sure that we have good Christian homes. We're going to talk to, first of all, we're going to look at, basically these first two lessons are just going to evaluate the home. Just to kind of see where we're at. A good check up on, on where we're at, and then we're going to decide from there how we need to work our way up to what we need to be. We're going to talk about fathers, we're going to talk about mothers, we're going to talk about husbands, talk about wives. We're going to talk about the marriage relationship itself. And we're going to talk about what the children's role is in all of this. So it'll be something that, that all of us, I believe, will, will gain from it. It'll take us a while to get through it. Again, you know when I do a series of lessons, we may have other lessons thrown in there. But I do encourage you to take notes. To If you need copies of lessons, I'll give them to you. If you have any questions, come to me. But it's something we all need. And when our homes are what they need to be, God's church uh, is even stronger. So let's think about some of these things. And as we think about the importance of the home, again, this will be part one. Part two will be, um, again, at another time when I have the opportunity to talk to you. But we start in Psalm chapter 95. This psalm is, is a psalm that really calls worship to attention, but also obedience. But it goes back in time as well and starts thinking about God's people and their unfaithfulness. And in Psalm 95, verses 8 and 10, it says, Do not harden your hearts as in the time of when Israel rebelled, in the day of their trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me and they tried me, though they saw my work. So they saw God's work and things didn't go right. So what happened? Well, he goes on to say, For 40 years I was grieved with, their, with that generation. And I said, Ultimately, there are people who go astray in their hearts and they don't know who I am. My question to you is this. Where does that happen? 
How does an entire generation, for the most part, save just a few people? How does that generation, how did that generation go so far astray? And maybe more so than that, what's happening to our generation and our society today? It has a direct reflection and effect on the church. So what's happening to the church? Well, it, as we talked about with our children this morning, it has everything to do with the foundation. <coughs> Appreciate the reading this morning. And it has everything to do with what Christ taught there. If our homes are founded on God, if we build our lives on God, then the structure is strong and it doesn't wash away with just anything that comes our way. If our homes are not strong, the same is to be true about that. It will wash away with any bit, bit of changing of conditions. I read an interesting article one time, and I've, I've used this a number of times over the years, and I want to share it with you because it really hits to the heart of what we're talking about. It's a story of a reporter who stood in front of a fire, a house fire, had just consumed a house entirely. As a reporter would do, he's trying to get everybody's angle and get everybody's feelings on it, and he turned to see some homeowners and one little son of those families looking and watching it burn. His home, his house rather, is being destroyed in front of his very eyes. The reporter turned looking for a human interest angle and a human interest angle and said to the boy, Son, it looks as if you don't have a home anymore. The little boy promptly answered, Oh yes, we have a home. We just no longer have a house to put it in. There was a lot of wisdom in what that boy said. And I'm afraid that in our society and in our country today, we're the exact opposite. We have nice houses, and they're fully furnished, and they're fancy, and we've got all the latest appliances, and everything's good. If it's not, we update it. We upgrade it. We renovate. We've got nice houses. But the problem is, in so many places in, in, in this world today, we don't have a home to put in that house. What did that little boy mean? What did he imply by that? And what's the lesson that we can learn from that? Well, that's what we're going to focus on today. When you start thinking about our lives today and, and where our society is at, most issues can be traced back to the home. Broken homes. Homes where either one dad or one mom has nobody else to help them and they're trying to raise children. And that's really, really hard. It's not the setup that, that God wants. Especially by themselves or not even, in some cases, even family to try to help. I hate to even have to say this, but there are many homes today who have two dads or two moms. What in the world does a kid do in that case? I don't know how many times over the years I would ask something to mama and she'd say, well, go ask your dad. And I'm not saying this jokingly, but what do those children do? If they have, they have two moms, they go to their mom and say, mom, can I do this? And she says, go ask your mom. Really? That's the condition of so many in society today, whether it's a broken home or whether it's a homosexual home. It's, it's no wonder we have as many troubles as we have. And that can't be. That can't be if we're going to be pleasing to God. When you consider all the crime and the violence and the division, the stress, depression, it all starts in the homes because homes are scattered, homes, homes are not stable, God is not the center, and that's an issue. But as God's people, we've got to do better. And it all starts at the foundation. I know this is a very simple elementary description here of a home, but I want you to remember this and implant it within your minds because we're going to stick with this a long time. You have to do it from the ground up. Now, I'm not a home builder. I'm, I can't construct anything. I can sure tear some stuff up, but I'm not good at building. But I do understand the basic concepts, and I'm sure we all do. And it all starts really not with the foundation. It starts even below that. There's perk tests to, to, to look at the condition of the soil. There is, is, is pads and foundations that have to be built up. You've got to make sure that what's beneath is going to hold up first. Then you go to the foundation of the home, and then what's inside of the home, and then you put a roof on it. You've got to build it from the ground up. And the same can be said true of, of it if we look at it in God's Word. So this morning as we go through these things, and we're going to just briefly look at each one, but I want you to look at your home and look at your family and look at what's going on in your house. And my question to you is, do you have a home? Think about it. Number one, what's beneath? Is there anything buried there that you know is there that is wrong, that is not right, that you need to be getting rid of? 
You've let it live there. You've tolerated it. It's kind of hidden. It's out of sight. Nobody really sees it. But it's there and you know it's there and it's always an issue. You just kind of keep it covered up. What's the problem with that? Well, we find the problem in Joshua chapter 7. In Joshua chapter 7, the clear instruction was, previous to that, when you go in and you destroy Jericho, you don't take of those spoils. Well, Achan did that. He took some of those prized possessions and he hid them beneath his tent. Verse 11 even points out that he took the accursed things and it was among his stuff. That's what God said. They took the accursed things and it's in their stuff. What's in your stuff? What's hidden in your stuff that you know shouldn't be there? You see, Israel went up to Ai, and it was even given the command, don't, don't take everybody. Ai is a small people. There won't be any problem, and we'll just, we'll just wax them and come home. But that didn't happen, did it? Why? Because of what was buried beneath Achan's home. Now, we're going to get into some lessons later on that deal with our influence, but this just begins to, to kind of scratch the surface. What's buried beneath your home that shouldn't be there not only affects you, but it affects others as well. So what's buried in your stuff? What's there? In verse 12 it says, the issue is, and God points out there, that they have become doomed to destruction, and I won't be with them anymore. Because there is something accursed among them, and I don't agree with that. God's not changed His perspective on that. We can't expect to win any battle that we face in this life if we've got sinful things buried in our stuff. So what's there? Achan pointed out in verse 21, yeah, it's right there. It's hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent. Nobody sees it, but it was a problem. God sees it. And it's hard for us to serve God and mammon, right? It's impossible. So what's buried in your stuff? You've got to clean it out if we're going to be pleasing to God. We really seriously need to think about that point and that point alone because it's a major problem. Jesus even pointed out that my father's house has been made a, a den of thieves in Matthew chapter 21. And he says, we're going to have to get rid of that. And he drove them out. So whatever is hidden that you know shouldn't be there, get rid of that. Or else your house will never stand. What's buried beneath? A lot of times we talk about what's going on inside of your home. We've got to start out even deeper than that. What's underneath? What's there that shouldn't be? Before we can ever talk about God give us Christian homes, we've got to get the unchristian things out of it. They can't be tolerated. The second thing is we've got to focus on God. Now, if you want to open your psalm books, I think it's number 186 uh, in, in our psalm books there, Praise for the Lord. So open your, open your psalm books there to 186. Let's read through this right quick, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. I'm not going to lead it because that will be a disaster, but we'll at least read through the verses here of number 186. God give us Christian homes. We're going to refer to it back a lot. This is the basically the central focus of these series of lessons. But notice here in number 1, or verse 1, God give us Christian homes. Notice the difference in each verse here. Where the Bible is loved and taught, again, number 2 is the focus on God. That has to be the foundation of our home. Homes where the Master's will is sought, homes crowned with beauty thy love hath wrought, God give us Christian homes. It all starts with that godly focus. Notice where it goes from there. And we'll go through this in our lessons. God give us Christians homes. Homes where the Father. Men, it starts with you. Fathers, it starts with you. Don't dodge that. Don't pass the buck to somebody else. Don't put it all on your wife. We'll deal with that another day. But it starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with us. Take that responsibility. Homes where the Father is true and strong. Homes that are free from the blood of wrong. Homes that are joyous with love and song. God give us Christian homes. And the mother. Verse 3, God give us Christian homes. Homes where the mother is as a queenly quest. Strives to show others thy way is best. Homes where the Lord is an honored guest. Very important. God give us Christian homes. Verse 4. God give us Christian homes. Here's the children. Homes where the children are led to know. Christ and His beauty who loves them so. Homes where the altar fires burn and glow. God give us Christian homes. How focused are you on your home? Being God-centered. Consider a few men who were. Abraham. One of the first homes that we were introduced to in Scripture, 
Genesis 18 and verse 19, God is pointing out here that he doesn't want to hide anything from Abraham. And the main reason that he gave that statement was based on what he says here. He says, I have known him and I understand him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord, that they're righteous, that they're just, that the Lord would bring to Abraham what is spoken to him. God says, I know how Abraham is, is, is guiding his home. And guess what? He knows how you guide yours as well, man. But he sees a home that is focused on God. No wonder he chose Abraham. No wonder he stuck with Abraham because he's somebody that understood what a foundation of a home is supposed to look like from a spiritual standpoint. How focused are we? Are we commanding our household focused on God? What about Cornelius? When Peter finally got there and, and, and he knew something special was going to be said about God, what did he say? Acts 10 and verse 33. We are all present before God to hear the truth. How focused are we on making sure that our whole household is present before God? Not just today, which is important. Don't get me wrong, but every day. Present before God, focused on God. So important. And obviously, as, as Sam read for us this morning in Joshua 24... We're going to have to make a stand, and that's going to have to be our focus today, and it never changes, no matter what anybody else does, no matter what other gods, little g-gods that anybody else serves. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's somebody that's focused on God. Are you focused on God? Is your family focused on God? Where are we at? What are you doing about it? And I go back to that previous point, what's, what's buried there? If something's buried there that you know shouldn't be there, then dig it up and get rid of it. Throw it out. Focus on God because the foundation of the home has to be set first. You don't build a roof first because why? Roofs don't just float, do they? I know that sounds corny, but you don't build a roof and say, all right, you float right there in the sky and I'll build up to you. No, you start at the bottom and you build up. So if there's something there that shouldn't be there, you get rid of it, and then you focus on the foundation. Is it what it needs to be focused on God? If not, we need to change it. That's why the home is so important, and we need to understand what makes the home stand. What about defilement? Is there any defilement from within? Notice what it says there in Matthew 15. Let's turn over there. Uh, didn't have that on the screen, so let's turn over there and read that. Matthew chapter 15. In particularly verse 17 and, and 18. Really the whole chapter is talking about defilement from within, at least the first half of the chapter. But as you look down into verse 17, notice this. Jesus asks a question. He says, do you not understand? Do we? That, that would be my question today for all of us. Do we not understand that whatever enters the mouth and goes into the stomach is eliminated, but the things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man? So what is he saying there? What he's saying there is that, yeah, you don't need, you know, maybe it's important that you keep your hands clean, but that's not the issue. The important thing is, is that you keep your heart clean. You see, some of these Jews and a lot of these Pharisees were so concerned about washing hands and being pure, and their heart was filthy. He says, that's where your defilement comes from. Not to eat with unwashed hands, but a heart that's full of filth. Why was Jesus so concerned about the heart? Did he want them to have dirty hands? No. Did he want them to be unsanitary? No. But he wanted them to understand if the heart is not right, then neither will the person be. There's no way that they can be. And suffice it to say, in comparison there, the home is the center of the family. And this is why the home is so important. If the home is not right, centered on God, then neither can the people who live in it be. And if they are, it's a daily, tremendous daily struggle because they're trying to do it without God. If there is defilement from within, and we've already talked about beneath, we're talking about inside now. If there is defilement from within, if there's something there that doesn't belong, then, then it's got to be cleaned up. Because just like Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6 and in verse 16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? I would add to that thought, what agreement has a Christian home to do with the worldly evils of this world? And yet we tolerate them so many times. And we know they shouldn't be there. And then we wonder why our family's in disarray. 
Think about it. If there's something there that doesn't belong, then get rid of it. And then there's the idea of unity. Just think about the importance of this as well. Something very striking happened there at Iconium in Acts chapter 14, as we study the Acts of the Apostles. It said it happened at Iconium that they went together into the synagogue and the Jews, uh, or to the Jews in the synagogue, and he spoke to the great multitude, and there were both Jews and Greeks there. Things were going pretty good. But notice what it says in verse 2. The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Poisoned their minds against the brethren. There's something very unique that takes place there. And, and we can learn this from looking at the King James Version and some of the original Greek words there. The King James reads there, and made their minds affected. That comes from two Greek words. One Greek word meaning to injure or to harm, and the other to breathe. So what they're doing there is that they're literally causing injury and causing harm by what's coming out of their mouth. Because there's not unity. What otherwise would have been a good day, what otherwise would have been a unifying, strong spiritual event, got completely blew up because of the fact that there wasn't unity. And you had some over here saying one thing, and some over here believing another thing, and when they met paths, they just blew up. If there's not unity in the home, if we're not all speaking the same thing, if we're not all having the same goals, how are we going to stand? Jesus even goes as far to say, a house divided against itself will not stand. There in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 25. So I ask you, is there unity in your home? Does everybody have the same goal, spiritually speaking? We may have different goals. The mother and father may have goals in, in a career, and they may have goals in, in parenting, and, and goals for their children, and then children have goals. Everybody has their own individual goals. But do those goals fall all into line with God's will? Namely, do you want to go to heaven? You see, when you really think about it, the home is like a, a vehicle that God has given us because we're at home a whole lot more than we're here. We're with our families a whole lot more than we're here at the church. Now, the church obviously is, is, is a huge part in this as well, but the home is like a vehicle that God has given us that we can ride through this life in to reach our goal of heaven. And it's a frightening thing to think that there are many vehicles who's never going to make it from point A to point B. The engine's going to fall apart, it's going to run out of gas, there's going to be a terrible crash because everybody's not trying to go down the same path. Does everybody in your home want to go to heaven? I think the answer would be yes, but the question is, do you act like it? Do we act like it? Are we all living for the same purpose and the same goal to make it to heaven, to be stronger people, to be Christian homes, to help the church to be stronger, and to do God's will. Jesus said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. So is a city, so is a house, so is a home. Is there unity in your home? And finally, prayer. I wouldn't put it last, but just thinking about it in kind of in an illustration type way, I put it last because that's really where our focus has to be, and that is upwards. Not downwards, but upwards. I read an interesting story one time that talked about a newly hired farmhand that a farmer hired to help with his property and to farm his land. And he, he gave him really good wages. Gave him good wages, gave him free boarding, had a wonderful, wonderful house to live in there with that farmer. But after two nights... The next morning, he went to get with the hand to go out and work that day, and he sees him packing his bags. Two nights, he's done. He's packing his bags. He's going home. And he says, where are you going? He says, I'm out. The farmer asked why. He said, because this house doesn't have a roof. And the farmer's pretty, pretty offended by that. He says, what do you mean the house doesn't have a roof? And he says, while I say that as a figure of speech, he says, but what I mean is a dwelling place where there are no prayers lifted up to God is like a house without a roof. He says, God has never petitioned in this house, and I'm not staying. I'm out. Was he right? Absolutely. Because if we don't have a roof to finish the structure, it doesn't really matter what's beneath because everything from the outside is still just going to come crashing in.
Every storm, every raindrop, dust, creatures, evil. If you don't have a roof to finish it, everything's coming in. And if we're not praying to God, then we don't have a cap on us. You see, that's what seals the deal. Because when we do everything that we can do to clear out the sin, when we do everything that we can do to focus on God, to get rid of the defilement, to make sure that we're on the same page, when we're doing all of our best at all of that, still we're human, right? And if you don't ask God to help you with all that, then none of that's really going to work. See how simple it is? A house without a roof is just like a home without prayer. How often do you talk to God in your home? Is it just at certain times or is it every day? How often do you teach your kids to talk to God? You don't have a roof if you don't. It's so important. Daniel did it three times a day. He did it in a place that wasn't his home. He had a house, but he wasn't in his normal setting, but he made it a home, right? Because he petitioned God. You see, we don't have to have a house to have a home. It makes it nicer, but we can be anywhere in any place and still have a home and still have a family as long as we turn to God. That's why Paul said to the church at Thessalonica, to rejoice always and to pray without ceasing and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That's part one of importance of the home. We're going to look at two other aspects in the next one. But I ask you as we bring our thoughts to a close this morning, do you have a house only? Or do you have a home to put on the inside of it? Does God live with you? Does Christ live with you? Are you getting rid of those things that shouldn't be there? Are you focused on God? If there is defilement within, are you willing to get rid of it? Are you striving to be unified? And most importantly, are we praying to God every day? If we're working on those things and doing those things in the right way, God will give us a Christian home. So how do you measure up? And think about this, and this will be our last point. Take any part of this structure out. Maybe say the ground isn't where it needs to be. Or the roof is second rate. Or the inside is not standard. Or you don't have a foundation. What's going to happen? You take any part of that structure out, the whole thing collapses. You've got to have all of it. So from the ground up, how do you measure up? I'm checking my home as well. And I know I've got some work to do. What about you? It may be something today that you need the prayers of the church to help you and to help all of us to be better about. We'd be happy to pray for you and with you today. But that's a pretty good self-check of where we're at. And we'll continue to look at some more things moving forward. But if there are some changes that you need to make to your life so that you can have a better Christian home, let's do that today. And if it's something we can help you with, we'd love to. What a better way to have a Christian home than to be a Christian, right? If you're not a Christian, if you've never been baptized, now is the time. Everything is ready. We're here to help. If you're, if you're ready to repent of your sins and to name the name of Christ and be baptized, now is the time. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, won't you come while Hollis stands and leads us in the song of invitation.